talk. Uh, thank you, Charles, for the introduction. So to complete the introduction, this is work I did with my co-supervisors at Telecom Paris Tech and at INRIA in Paris, France. So with Françoise Détienne and Jean-Daniel Fiquet. So in a relatively recent podcast, uh, Scott Murray, a code artist, mentioned the increasing popularity of a visualization format where authors or designers first tell a story which then opens up uh, so that users can then, well, can dive into more detail. So this balance between author-driven and reader or user-driven uh, approaches is the basis for what Siegel and here and Holman and Jakopoulos have called narrative visualizations. Now there's been a lot of research into the design of narrative visualizations. Um, so I won't say too much here. I'll simply introduce these two uh, structures for interactive narrative visualizations identified by Siegel and here. So the first one is the martini glass structure, which essentially resembles the description uh, provided by Scott Murray. So basically, the structure starts with a very uh, linear and highly author-driven uh, story, let's say, that then opens up to let users explore the data or find more information. Um, and the interactive slideshow follows a pretty basic slideshow structure like this presentation. Each view is a specific, well, each slide, sorry, is a specific view on the data. And within each slide, there can be varying degrees of interactivity. So while there's been a lot of papers on design or designing uh, narrative visualizations, there hasn't been much on the evaluation of such visualizations. So here what we're interested in is seeing whether having a narrative build up, so typically we focus on the uh, slideshow structure. If we have a set of initial slides that create a narrative component that introduce the story, introduce initial insights that provide sort of open and unanswered questions, can this lead users to then engage in a more exploratory view at the end? So to test this, we first designed a visualization called the CO2 Pollution Explorer. So as the title indicates, we used a CO2 pollution data uh, from 1977, uh, 1971 sorry, to 2007 uh, in different countries across the world. The structure is the same as in the model I just showed. So we have an introductory narrative component, again, which tells a story, provides initial insights and unanswered questions. That then opens up to an explore section where there are many more interactive features that allow users to dig for insights in the data. So I stress here that what we're looking at, what we're trying to evaluate is not the engagingness, let's say, of uh, narrative visualizations for communication. It's really on how effective uh, introduce, well, inserting a story or narrative techniques into an exploratory visualization, how effective th can this be for engaging users to explore data? And so to do this, uh, we created two versions of the CO2 Pollution Explorer, one that included uh, the narrative component at the beginning and the explore section at the end, and one that didn't include the narrative component. So respectively, we called them the storytelling version and the no storytelling version. And what we did is we simply alternately assigned each of these versions to new visitors to create a setting for an A-B test. So with this design, the question is now, how do we measure user engagement and exploration? And how do we measure it on the internet? How do we measure it on a large scale? So typically on the internet, we, ca we don't have access to all the traditional lab-based uh, equipment. Um, so we have to find other ways and, and also uh, if we want to be ecologically valid, it's often quite hard to deploy surveys and get qualitative or subjective data. So we have to basically base all our, our understanding of engagement on user activity, user behavior, and tracing this behavior. But the problem with traces is that they're extremely noisy. So I don't know if any of you have ever tried to trace activity on the internet. Um, so, and unfortunately in information visualization, there hasn't been that many studies that have focused on uh, understanding web logs, basically, of what people do uh, with visualizations. So we need to structure these traces a wee bit. So what we did and what we proposed first is to filter out what we've come to call meaningful interactions. So a, typically a meaningful hover interaction will be a hover interaction that will affect the display, so typically show a tooltip or highlight a specific part of the display, and that will last longer than 250 milliseconds so the people or the user actually has time to perceive the effect and a meaningful click interaction is a click that occurs on a specific interactive feature of the display, an identified interactive feature of the display. So this allows to structure, filter out a, a 
future, well, a little bit. But what we need now is to contextualize these low-level interactions. So what do they mean within the interface? What does the user intend to do? So for this, we structured a sort of taxonomy of the different operations, semantic operations, we call them, um, users could do in the explore section of the CO2 exp uh, pollution explorer. So we have inspect operations, connect operations, select operations, filter, uh, explore, and narrate. I won't go into too much detail. You can read it all in the paper. Um, and with these uh, more uh, meaningful, let's say, or more semantic uh, inter interactions, we then need to find patterns or understand how these can reveal some form of engagement and some form of exploratory behavior, because what we're looking for is engagement and exploration. So for engagement, we looked into the HART framework that was proposed by Rodden and Nell, which is also used in Google Analytics. And basically, they define engagement as the frequency and intensity of use of an, uh, uh, of an application, sorry and the depth of interaction within a session. And for the exploratory behavior, Gotts and Venn have identified patterns of user behavior in terms of analytic actions. So they've identified four uh, different patterns, a scan pattern, a flip pattern, a swap pattern, and a drill down pattern. Once again, I won't go into too much detail here. Um, it is, there is more information in the paper. So with this in mind, we published the visualization uh, first on the media part which is a French news and opinion outlet, quite a popular news and opinion outlet, and on visualizing.org, which is a quite a popular uh, visualization gallery online. And we kept these two distinct because uh, we expected that people coming from Mediapart who would arrive to the, uh, on our website through Mediapart would be people looking for news, looking for information. Mediapart isn't particularly known for publishing visualizations or interactive visualizations, so we considered this kind of a, a priori, but considered these people to be an information savvy population, whereas people coming through visualizing.org would be people more interested in visualization, obviously. So we considered them a visualization savvy population. So altogether, we got roughly 4,000 visits in the three first months of 2014. Uh, the visualization was curated in different, different uh, referential visualization galleries online. So typically, the best of the visualization web, January 2014 on visualizing data and the visualizing highlights March 2014 on visualizing.org. And so with this, we conducted our study. So, uh, sorry, I didn't mention it in the previous slide. We first focused on the information savvy population. So we wanted to know what people who were coming here, coming to the visualization looking for news or information would do. And so our main qualitative hypothesis was that the presence of this sort of build-up, this narrative build-up, would successfully engage um, or en enhance engagement um, and exploration. And so to operationalize this qualitative hypothesis, we set two simple quantitative hypotheses. The first one on time, so people in the storytelling version of the visualization uh, would spend more time in the explore section. And the second one, um, they would perform more semantic interactions. So all our results are based on estimation and um, uh, so ratios. So the way this works, so we present 95% uh, uh, confidence intervals. On the left, you have the actual values here in seconds. So on top for the storytelling version and below for the no storytelling version. And to the right, you have the ratio between the two. Uh, basically, to go quickly, just look at the ratio. If the point estimate is around one or on one, we can say there is no difference between the two versions, so between behavior and the two versions. If the point estimate is below one and the confidence intervals do not overlap one, then we can say that people in the no storytelling version uh, spent more time exploring the visualization than people in the storytelling version and vice versa. If the point estimate is above one and the uh, confidence intervals do not overlap one, people in the storytelling version spent more time exploring. So here clearly we see that people in the no storytelling version spent more time. Um, and actually, they spent just about twice as much time as we see there's um, it's just about at 0.5. So this invalidates our first hypothesis. And likewise, uh, if we just focus on the ratios once again for the second hypothesis, we see that all of them, with a slight exception of the connect, but still, um, are below one, which means that people in the no storytelling version can perform more meaningful or semantic uh, operations so basically, this invalidates both our quantitative hypotheses, which invalidates our qualitative hypothesis. 
So to make sure that this wasn't biased by people's expectation, once again, people coming from Mediapart uh, may have been expecting just simple text or weren't expecting any way to, to have to interact for information or to, to explore for inf uh, information. We looked at what people did coming from visualizing.org. So here I only show the ratios. And for each cell, I show on top the reference with the info, uh, information savvy population and below uh, the visualization savvy population. Basically, what we see is that the, uh, there's a strong trend. And basically, the behaviors are very similar, well, are similar. So to finish, we also looked um, at the relative numbers of uh, semantic operations people performed, once again, to look at what kind of exploratory behavior these people um, had. And so we clearly see here that the inspect operation was predominant, which means, coming back to Gotts and Venn's uh, patterns of user behavior, that the scan pattern was predominant. So this suggests a very sort of superficial uh, exploratory behavior, because scanning basically is just uh, hovering over specific features of the interface to show specific values and show tooltips. So they don't, people didn't really dig into the, um, to the data. Now to make sure that this wasn't simply due to uh, potential design errors that we kind of uh, found w in the CO2 Pollution Explorer, because we found uh, several odd behaviors um, which m seemed, to, well possibly indicated design errors. We uh, created two extra visualizations, so the Economic Return on Education Explorer and the Nuclear Power Grid. And among these uh, possible design flaws, if I dare call them so, um, the richness of the data set of the CO2 Pollution Explorer um, was something that caught our attention because basically uh, it could um, answer certain questions. It, there was room for some exploration, but it wasn't a very rich data set. So basically we expected that if people didn't see the point or if people didn't see the data set as being rich enough, they wouldn't engage in the exploration of the data. So what we did for the two new visualizations and to test for this uh, idea of data richness is that we created one with a much simpler data set and one with a much richer data set. So the economic return on, ex on Education Explorer uses a richer data set, so I call it the richer visualization, and the nuclear power grid uses a simpler data set, so I use, call it the simpler visualization. So again, the design uh, has an introductory uh, narrative component with four slides that leads to an exploratory section or an explore section uh, that has many more interactive features that allows users to dig for information. Um, we uh, created a taxonomy of the different semantic operations people could perform. And the same thing for the simpler visualization. And we published these two once again on Mediapart and visualizing.org. Uh, the richer visualization was once again picked up on visualizing.org in the visualizing highlights August 2014. So we kept the same hypothesis as for the first study because again we wanted to see whether the first study was flawed by, uh, well due to design issues. Um, and we also added a second qualitative hypothesis which was related to the data. So basically the richer the data, um, the more engaged people will be in the exploration. So for the first qualitative hypothesis, we kept the t two same quantitative hypotheses. And the way uh, the results are presented here, um, again, if we focus just on the right on the ratios, um, we have they're divided in three. And so we have the ratios for the first case, the CO2 pollution explorer. For the second case, the uh, economic return on education explorer. And the third case, the nuclear power grid. What we see is that, once again, everything is to the left. So once again, people in the no storytelling version spend a lot more time exploring the visualization. And the same thing for interaction or for semantic operations. So once again, both our quantitative hypotheses are invalidated and both our qualitative hypotheses are invalidated. To finish, we also once again look back at what uh, semantic operations people performed most to determine what kind of exploratory behavior they, were, uh, they had. And once again, the inspect operation was predominant, meaning that the scan operate well. The scan uh, behavior was predominant, which suggests that once again, the exploratory behavior was quite superficial. So to conclude and to come back to the title of this presentation and of the paper, storytelling and information visualizations does it engage users to explore data? Well, our results suggest not. Um, <laughs> however, I do at this point once again want to emphasize the fact that we really only focus on storytelling or narrative techniques as a build-up for exploration. 
we don't focus on the engagingness of narrative visualizations themselves. Um, and this is kind of also supported by things we saw in the deployment of our visualizations because, um, well, ultimately they did receive a lot of visitors. Typically the economic return on education explorer is now about, well, has now had above 100,000 unique visits. Um, people spend quite a lot of, well, quite a big amount of time on the web pages. And they have all uh, triggered interesting discussions and debate on the websites they've been published on, on websites they've been picked up by, and on, uh, well, in social media. The thing is, most of these discussions don't actually relate to the data. They relate to people's a priori or background knowledge on the topics that the visualizations uh, discuss. So this leads me to a more sort of open question, broader question on information visualization, so-called for the people or for the masses. And basically, how should we consider this kind of, these visualizations? How should we consider them for design? So basically, uh, first approach would be to consider them as a medium for communication and for persuasion, which is the traditional approach for narrative visualizations. Um, a second approach would be to consider them as a tool for exploration and analysis, which is the traditional approach, sorry, in InfoViz. And the third one, um, kind of related to uh, the discussions that we uh, saw around our visualizations, should we design them simply as social obje objects that can trigger discussions and debate on different platforms? Whatever, basically, the data. It's just the topic and the visualization itself is sufficient, basically, to trigger uh, user engagement among, well, people's engagement and discussion among themselves. So with these broad questions in mind, I'm happy to accept yours. Thanks. So we have two mics in the middle of the room. Hi, uh, Robert Cosero, Tableau Software. I've got some questions and opinions on this because I always get dinged on on the measures for engagement when, when, when I write papers and everybody says, well, but is time actually a valid way of measuring this? Because when we show that people actually spend more time on things, people say, well, yeah, that's because they're confused and because this and that. And so it's interesting that you're, you know, so I want to turn this around a bit and kind of use this against you because uh, I wonder if you were measuring the right thing because you were measuring engagement and I, I totally agree with what you're doing there in, in how you do this. But you didn't ask people questions afterwards how much they actually remembered or how much they understood about what, you were t what the story was about. And my conjecture would be that they get a lot more out of the presentation, even if they didn't bother to actually click on any of the exploratory parts, than, than when they just were supposed to just click and not have the introduction. So I think they would still get more out, even if it wasn't more engaging, perhaps, in the sense that you could measure, but it could still give them much more information that it would take with them afterwards than if, if, if it just gave them the interactive one. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I totally agree um, with what you just said. So the two things. The first one is uh, on collecting sort of more qualitative feedback at the end. This is a big problem or trouble we had with the ecologic validity, basically, of our study. So going through a uh, news site, it's actually quite hard to come back and find the readers and know who they are and, um, to actually understand what they got out of the visualization. And for the, the second thing is, once again, I, r I agree with the fact that people may have got out more information from the story component itself than from actually digging for themselves in the, in the data. Um, this is why uh, we don't, well, I try to stress the fact that we don't really measure the engagingness of narrative visualizations as a communication medium, but more as a build-up for this uh, thing at the end. So I agree that we, it would be interesting as future work to c try to combine this more qualitative approach at the end, but I think a different method is necessary, or some way, well, we need to find some way to track who our users are to be able to get in touch with them to get to know what they actually learned. Hi, Jill Ward from Google. Um, I was going to ask something similar to the previous question, but and I had an additional question too, which was, it seemed like one of your uh, second set of visualizations got picked up and was um, probably promoted more widely, and whereas the simple one wasn't. Do you think yeah. that had some bias in your results? Um, it, I don't think it had biases. Uh, Sorry, I've disconnected my computer. But um, what it did do is that we did get a lot less users on the third visualization, um, so the one that didn't get picked up. Uh, so basically, we discussed this in the paper, but all our estimations, the confidence intervals are much wider, so there's much more diversity um, in the results. So it has to be considered more cautiously, but I don't think it invalidates the results. So we do see some strong trends, even though, once again, the, the confidence intervals are quite wide. 
I'm going to jump back in again because there's no one behind me. But it, it would seem that it would be harder to find that visualization, and therefore it would be people who were trying uh, harder to find it. Not necessarily, not because it was published, I mean, exactly in the same way on Mediapart and on visualizing.org originally. Um, the the visualize well, when it was curated in the different galleries, it, the, this sort of came uh, after the main sort of rush, the main, so we first published them, and then it was roughly, for the first one, it was two months after that it got picked up, um, and for the second one, uh, so for the economic return on education, it was a month and a half afterwards. But basically our data, especially for the economic return on education and the nuclear power grid, the two second visualizations, our data is only for a three weeks period, 